this is what I got because they don't end. Folks, I think we'll give it a minute to let other people sign on and we'll get started soon. Okay, should we take it off? Should we go ahead and get started, Jason? I think so, Corinna. Are all of the speakers here? Yes, they are. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'll I'll just sort of kick it off and hand it off to you, Jason, and then we'll hand it off to Karina. Um, I want to welcome everyone. This is Mark Humpert from AFWA, uh, and really appreciate everybody's time today, and particularly our speakers. Um, for this great session. And I was thinking a little bit about uh, this today and how, uh, and really appreciate Karina for organizing uh, this session um, on equity. You know, we've, we've done a lot, I think, or we're making a lot of progress or have made a lot of progress since the last action plans in 2015 with this idea of relevancy. And I think it's, it's becoming, we're be, it's becoming clear in, in our minds of the importance of involving everyone in conservation, that we can't do it alone. It's such a big and overwhelming task. And uh, how can we do better uh, by being more relevant, reaching out more broadly uh, to more diverse communities? And you know, if you look at kind of the purpose behind the relevancy roadmap, it's about doing more and better conservation. And so uh, I think we, we, what we're gonna learn today and what will be the start of a I think a longer conversation uh, is that we, we just need, need help, we need tools, we need better information so that we can reach everybody, you know, in our communities that care about fish and wildlife. And we're just at a perfect time to have this conversation as, uh, you know, most states, over 40 states are getting ready to revise their, uh, this will be the third generation now of state wildlife action plans. Uh, so again, thank you, Karina. Uh, thanks to our speakers. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, session, and I'm going to hand it over to Jason for some opening remarks. Sorry, thanks. I think Mark's already covered everything I might say. I'll just give briefly some logistics on the day. So we're first going to have a panel discussion that Karina will be leading. And then after that, we do want to leave some time here for a breakout group, you know, to be able to take what we're hearing and reflect on that among small groups where we can really have an open discussion. So this part of the session is recorded. The breakouts won't be. And what we'll ask for is in the breakouts if someone could help take notes or at least capture highlights and report back out. Uh, and we'll come back to those a little bit later on, but we're looking to hear about what the challenges you and your agency face in engaging the full diversity of residents in your state and tribal nations in the swap revision process. You know, where are those opportunities? And what are the challenges you face in engaging the full diversity of residents in your state and tribal nations and swap and conservation implementation? And again, where are those oppor opportunities? You know, how do you think about prioritizing conservation actions geographically? So like I said, we're recording this session, we'll be taking notes and during the breakouts, if someone could also just capture highlights and report back out. So now I kind of geek out because I've been wanting to hear from Karina for a while now. 
um, ever since I first learned about you and read your Wikipedia page and saw the pictures you had posted. So um, happy to introduce Karina Newsom, who is a National Wildlife Federation employee and the moderator of today's session. Karina, thanks so much again for helping us organize this. Yes, thank you, Jason, and thank you, Mark, for inviting us uh, to be here today. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Karina Newsom. I'm a conservation scientist at National Wildlife Federation, and I am most excited to introduce uh, a lineup of people who I have long admired for many years, um, who are incredible leaders in the conservation space. Uh, we have Alex Troutman, who is a wildlife biologist, an environmental justice advocate, and an author who just published several incredible field guides. I encourage you to go check that out. Um, we have Deja Perkins, who is a geospatial analytics PhD student who will be sharing a lot about her work with us today, um, who has led some incredible research on particip participatory science, especially when it comes to the world of birds and bird conservation. And then we have Lydia Parker, who is the CEO of Hunters of Color, who I'm sure many of you have heard speak before recently or in the past couple of years. Um, being a leading voice and leader when it comes to um, indigenous leadership and engagement in conservation um, across the continent. So Lydia, we're so glad to have you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I know you are incredibly busy. Um, and so, as I mentioned, my name is Karina Newsom, and as part of the ongoing work uh, in partnership with state agencies, um, which has included things like uh, multi-state collaborations, uh, myself, along with John Cantor, are really excited um, to be able to uh, host this panel today and look forward to continued work with state agencies as you are navigating the SWAP process, state wildlife action planning process, and integrating equity into that work through and through. Um, and so we'll go ahead and kick it off right away. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask the panelists to take a few minutes to uh, introduce themselves, share a little bit about their background, and answer the question of how equity informs their pursuit of science and or community engagement. And we'll go ahead and start with Alex. Oh, yes, my name is Alex. Um, so I'm a current Kanos fellow and I'm a wildlife biologist. I've worked with several different agencies from the Fish and Wildlife Service to the National Park Service. Um, for me, I grew up um, luckily and I'm blessed to have a family that enjoyed the outdoors and having my own um, land with my family where many people um, didn't have that. So I was always connected to nature. And I realized that even as a black man, that's a privilege um, to have land that, to enjoy nature with, um, as many people in my area um, didn't have, own their own land or lived in the city. Um, so what pursued me to have a kind of voice in the environmental field um, is knowing that access um, is not always there for everyone, even if they're right next to a national park, state park there's still a uh, delay or access um, that they do not have. That could be either from transportation issues or just um, going to that state park and being denied the equal access of enjoying the park without having someone call the police on them or question why they're in the park. Or some people may even question, why are they listening to music while on the trail? Um, so that's not uh, equal access. Um, if you're going to have access, you need to be able to enjoy the park in any way that you want to uh, without being denied the access. There's different ways to connect to nature and having equal access is one of those ways. So for me, I'm there to make sure that everyone has uh, equal access either through um, transportation means or just by being in a park and being able to do things like grill and have music at the state park um, and not have anyone try to call the police on you or um, deny that opportunity because you're not recreating or enjoying the park in the quote unquote right way. Alex, thank you so much for that and for your continued leadership and showing us what it looks like to um, make space for everyone to be able to enjoy uh, our, our, our public lands uh, and, and natural spaces. Uh, equitably. Um, we will now move over to Deja to introduce herself. Thanks, Karina. Hello, everyone. My name is Deja Perkins. I am currently a uh, second year PhD student at North Carolina State University within the Center for Geospatial Analytics. My research currently investigates data gaps in participatory science data sets. Um, I think of these data sets as, uh, I particularly look at large scale data sets 
So these nationwide um, and even sometimes global data sets um, that deal with volunteer generated data, um, volunteer monitoring, and really looking at the gaps that exist within those data sets and what, which communities are being left out of the picture and out of the story. And then how can we better engage those communities um, with more relevant framing um, to make sure that they also have a, a, an avenue in order to tell their story. I'm originally from Chicago. So I grew up like in, in the city on the Southeast side. Um, I was probably 10 minutes from my local park, but it was a sports recreation park, which is the case for a lot of parks in black communities. They primarily focus on having athletic fields for things like football, baseball, having basketball courts and playgrounds. So there wasn't necessarily anywhere close by that I could go and go on a trail. And honestly, as a child, I was not aware of recreation in the form of going on hikes or go, even going bird watching. Um, I don't come from an outdoorsy family. Um, I do think that my family has connections to nature through um, like gardening and um, more so um, with like food and um, and that type of connection over um, the re more recreational connections. And equity informs my pursuit of of, well, just informs the work that I do because I, I grew up seeing um, how landscapes change in different income neighborhoods and just being able to, in a, in growing up in a place like Chicago that is still highly segregated, seeing who has access to nature and where the green space patches are within the city um, and not having access to environmental programming as a child all of those things kind of inform my passion for making sure that other people have access, that other people are aware of the opportunities and these spaces that can be beneficial, not only for learning, but for mental and physical health as well. Thank you so much, Deja. And we will uh, go to Lydia. There you go, Seok Michael. Welcome to We're All Doing Lydia Young Cots. Um, hi everyone, my name is Lydia uh, and I'm the executive director, or sorry, <laughs> I just told Karina that just changed. I'm the CEO of Hunters of Color. I uh, did a little rebranding there, um, but I'm the CEO of Hunters of Color. My pronouns are she, her, uh, and I'm from the Walker Mohawk Band of Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, or you can just say Mohawk because it's a lot easier. <laughs> um, but I think that where equity comes in is really in the foundations of our organization, Hunters of Color. Um, there was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, study that came out in 2016 that uh, looked at demographics of hunting and fishing and conservation work. And in hunting, uh, less than 4% of, of hunters identify as people of color, uh, which clearly doesn't match up with the demographics of our nation. And it also doesn't make sense because anyone who's here today, we're here because our families were successful hunters at some point. Um, and for me personally, uh, part of the impetus for starting Hunters of Color was that my family in particular has been hunting on this land um, since the beginning of time. And so it's more than just a, a sport or recreation. Um, it's a connection to culture. Um, and the same can be said uh, for African-Americans or Black folks who have relied so heavily on hunting um, as a means of sustenance. Um, and as a tradition and culture as well. Um, and again, that, that spreads uh, across the nation that um, lack, of, lack of representation and lack of uh, even participation in hunting um, and fishing and conservation work. Uh, I believe that Yale came out with a study that was something about something like 82% of conservation or green space workers identify as white as well. Um, and so anyways, it's kind of the history of, of why and how I got started in this work. Um, but if y'all are taking notes, and I hope that you are, um, the, the word that really comes to mind when I think of equity, um, it's not equality, it's much different. And it's really, really important to know what the difference is. So if you haven't Googled the difference, please do. Um, and the word that comes to mind when I think about equity is intersectionality. Um, and understanding uh, different levels of privilege and understanding different levels of access when it comes to the outdoors. Um, and anyways, look up 
uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and inter intersectionality. Um, and that's really the framework behind all the work we do uh, in Hunters of Color. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lydia and Alex and Deja for sharing your, a little bit about, about your background. Um, and we'll, we'll jump right into our discussion here. Um, so the first question that I'm asking to the, to the whole panel here is, what is the role of and benefit of having communities, particularly uh, Black and Indigenous and other frontline communities, um, in the success of biodiversity conservation? What is the role and benefit of communities, particularly frontline communities, in the success of biodiversity conservation? Whoever would like to start, you can jump in. I don't mind starting here. Um, <clears throat> wow, this is, um, in some ways, this can be, this feels like a, a loaded question um, because historically our communities have not been a part of conservation and um, we haven't been able to see our, well, in the, the westernized view of conservation because a lot of indigenous um, communities have been doing conservation throughout their lifetimes um, for generations. Um, I think of the Gullah Geechee community um, on the coast of South, um, South Carolina and the work that they do just in their practices in maintaining their land um, and how they are doing conservation work, even though that conservation work doesn't look like um, the traditional type of work that we are taught about um, in our in our programs um, as we um, as we further on into our career. So I'll kind of echo um, some statistics that Lydia mentioned earlier, and that is within bird watching itself um, or the use of um, eBird. Um, if we have any birders here, you know that eBird is a popular um, tool used um, by bird watchers, but that data produced also um, helps inform conservation. But it's a recent study um, that came out in 2022 found out that 94% of eBird users are white. And that is really telling because when you have um, participatory data that like that, um, there are biases that are produced. And a lot of the work that I have done has started to uncover some of those biases created through volunteer participation. And when you have um, a, only a certain community being a part of um, producing the data and telling the story of what conservation looks like or where are the priority areas that we need to focus on, you're leaving out um, the rest of the people that live here in the US. Um, and so it's really important that we give a, a voice um, and create space for um, Black and Indigenous communities, um, really like all minority communities, to have um, a voice within um, where conservation is going. And so um, a lot of the en engagement work that, that is done, it, it really, all that work is reflected in the data that we collect. Um, so if we're not engaging all communities, then we are only, um, we are perpetuating a cycle and, and uplifting that only a, a certain community's voice matters or that only their needs matter. And so once we start to um, create space and allow for historically excluded communities to, to um, really tell us how we want, how they want um, conservation to look like or what conservation looks like in their community, then that um, would be a huge step forward um, within biodiversity conservation. Because if we're not looking in all spaces, um, it doesn't matter what statistical tests you run in order to you know, account for those gaps, you're still um, excluding very important perspectives from the work. That is incredible. And I, and I encourage you all, as was mentioned, to take notes as we'll be discussing how this is reflected in the state that you work in and the agency you work in and how you can think about reimagining where data is collected, where conservation investments are made. So um, Deja, thank you so much for, for uh, sharing that, that information. Um, Alex and Lydia. Go ahead, Alex, if, if you're ready. Yeah, I'll go. Sorry, I couldn't find my my mouse to get on mute. Um, yeah, so I'll start um with um with this that 
we as indigenous and um, black individuals have always had a um, a hand in the success of biodiversity and conservation. Um, but many times it has been hidden or um, I would say hidden, I'm not gonna say forgotten about. It has a lot of times been purposely hidden. Uh, if we look at many of the national parks, uh, wildlife refuges, many of those um, have been um, constructed or had uh, Black and Indigenous hands on them um, through um, <clears throat> through the um, CCC groups, conservation groups. Um, uh, some of the first uh, like park rangers were um, um, Black individuals from the Buffalo Soldiers. And a lot of times what um, is in place now, what we um, call the wilderness, um, um, here's a definition from the U.S. Forest Service as wilderness, an area where the earth is and its community of life are untrammeled by human, where man itself is a visitor who does not remain. Um, but this neglects the fact that indigenous people were here and the land was already cultivated um, but in the Western white sense, the land has been um, untrammeled um, by humans, but um, it's totally negating the fact that indigenous individuals was here. Um, so we have always had a hand in the success of biodiversity and conservation, um, but many times it's uh, forgotten or it's hidden. Um, and a lot of times we um, as humans are uh, as Western societies come into areas that already have, um, I guess, like a local knowledge of what flora and fauna is in the area, but we don't come in um, to actually uh, work with the community. We come in and say, we're the experts. Uh, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and we totally destroy uh, what the, um, home people have in place of that region and later on come and fix it and you know what? Oh, you were right. Maybe we shouldn't have been built a dam there or maybe we shouldn't have um, dredged um, this river, this creek. Um, so we need to get back to looking at what people groups are already in the land, um, work, working it or have familiar ties to the land um, and understand that within those individuals and family ties, they have already had a success in um, the conservation of that land and we can actually learn from them um, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, so I just, I wanna go back to say that many of the frontline communities, uh, we have always had a success in this biodiversity conservation, but many times um, it is, hitting or um, frowned upon for our knowledge to be um, put in place. And later on, we wanna come back and, and say, oh, maybe they were right and we should do it this way. And then we steal that ideal and say it's our ideal or they steal the ideal and say it's their ideal, so to speak. Alex, thank you so much for bringing that that perspective that is both historical and current as far as how conservation has happened in, in many in, in across the across the country. Um, and it's incredible to see when you understand, you know, how black and indigenous communities have shaped the land and the biodiversity that now it are that now exists in those places, it really changes one's perspective around what does conservation actually mean? Um, what does it look like to do it equitably? Lydia, I'll pass it to you. Um, I also want to thank you, Alex and Asia, for um, advocating for Indigenous people. Uh, that was so, I, you made me tear up a little bit, Alex. Um, that was so beautiful uh, and so true. Um, I always say, you know, most of our cultures, most Indigenous cultures, didn't have a word and don't have a word for conservation because we didn't need one. We didn't have to to fix something. Um, the idea of the North American model of wildlife conservation uh, was created to help stop the um, overhunting, help stop the markets, help um, fix things that had been uh, wronged. Um, and the fact of the matter is they're like Alex was saying, there's no such thing as wilderness. There's no such thing as a pure <laughs> untouched landscape. We've been here and we have been touching the land. We've been manipulating the land, even if it isn't up to Western standards or if Western science hasn't quite figured out that we've been doing it right yet, 
um, we've been here and we indigenous people only make up 5% of the population of earth, but we protect over 80% of the earth's biodiversity. Um, and I always like to quote uh, the late great Oneida comedian, Charlie Hill, who said that whenever there's a problem um, on, on this land, ask the Indians because we have the owner's manual. <laughs> and um, obviously funny, but so true. Um, it's, it's what we've been doing. And um, even I think of like dendrochronology, for example, proving that the cultural fires of prescribed burns that, we, that we've always done on this continent are important. <laughs> and now we're seeing that in the West and, and everyone's talking about fuel reduction acts and whatnot. Um, and it's just like the no brainer to indigenous communities, right? Um, but the last thing I'll say about this, why engaging indigenous communities and people of color, BIPOC, whatever you wanna say um, is so important is because whether you like it or not, by the year 2044, the US will be majority BIPOC uh, people of color. And I always say too, you don't have to like us. You don't have to, I hope you do, <laughs> but you don't have to um, even like the word equity. We get a lot of pushback for using that word, to be honest. We get death threats, by the way. Like this is real life. <laughs> like this is real stuff. When, when people of color come to these spaces, it is really scary sometimes. And we are told that we're not welcome here still a lot. Um, but anyways, the fact of the matter is, in 24, by the year 2044, which isn't that long from now, we are gonna need all people to see themselves as stakeholders of the planet. Um, and as, as it currently is, that's not the case um, because we've been excluded. And so it is on all of us to create more equitable spaces for the future of conservation in the planet. Thank you so much, Lydia. Yes, the success of biodiversity conservation actually does hinge on equitable engagement of, of all communities across uh, North America. And so um, another reason, in addition to the to the, the moral requirement, the moral need there, um, it is required to, to successfully um, uh, conserve the, the, the spaces and the, and the species that, that share the spaces that we live in. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into to some individualized questions. And I'm gonna start with Deja who uh, kind of primed us on the, the work that she does in participatory science and the data associated with it. So you've worked, Deja, in wildlife biology and in data science for a while um, with a focus, as we've talked about, in equity in participatory science. Um, so where do you see opportunities for state agencies to integrate equity into their use of um, or collection of biodiversity data to inform where and how they do their conservation work? Yes, great question. Thank you, Karina. I will say that um, participatory data is a is a tool that we should be taking advantage of. Um, these participatory there are so many participatory projects that exist, and there are a lot of national um, nationwide data sets um, that exist for things like precipitation, for uh, phenology, for um, bird data, and we should be we should be taking advantage of those data sets that already exist and helping to um, contribute to those data sets and utilize the fact that those data sets exist. So um, I primarily see the role of um, participatory science with state agencies is to actually utilize those and see what data is already out there. I'm sure many, many of your agencies have GIS um, teams or an employee that um, has a responsibility of creating maps and doing various um, GIS analysis. Why not take some of those data sets and kind of and even integrate the data that you've already collected with your field technicians to see, okay, where are we collecting data? What's missing? Where have we not collected data? And, you know, do some type of audit about where you're actually going out and doing the work. And why are those the areas that you've been prioritizing? Are there other areas in need um, that you all haven't been prioritizing that um, could be a potential for not only um, conservation work, but also engagement? Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges with participatory science projects 
it, and, and honestly, conservation as a whole, as well as the framing, um, we don't, it's not relevant. It's not a, cult, a lot of it is not a culturally relevant framing um, for anyone outside of the dominant culture. Um, so even the idea of conservation, like it exists because of the like colonial practices and, and even capitalism and the over harvesting and, you know, the idea that this earth is here for us to take, 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 like that is the reason why we have to even do, we have to do conservation work. Um, there were people who thought that it was just their right to be able to extract until there could not until the earth could not be extracted from anymore and there are people like that who, who still exist and so a lot of it is about um we need to think about more more relevant framing and so what are ways that we can put that we can think about conservation in a way that would be relevant to other groups that we might want to engage especially for groups who may feel like because we didn't do the damage why do we have to help clean it up? Um, so just kind of thinking about the way you frame your engagement work um, and doing like a variety of, of audits to think about where are we currently doing the work and where are the gaps and what's, what's needed in order to form a more complete picture. Um, because like I said, participatory science data sets already have an, a volunteer bias based on who um, participates. And who participates in participatory science projects are people who are already science educated. They already, they're you know, highly educated. They have degrees, sometimes multiple degrees. Um, they are a lot of times high earning. Um, and a lot of, majority of the time they are white. And so, if we think about the way that we're framing these, um, the the narrative of why these, why the work is important, why it needs to be done, um, then maybe we can have better engagement. And we can also see like maybe there are other prior priority areas that we need to be focusing on. Um, yeah. Every time Deja speaks, I get goosebumps. Deja, thank you so much for for sharing for sharing that. Um, and, and one of the interesting conversations that came out from a, a, the Seattle meeting that was a couple of months ago, Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, is we were talking about things like in addition to, you know, where are we geographically, where are we collecting data about biodiversity, you know, where are we then investing our, our you know, our dollars for conservation uh, uh, actions um, and implementation, but like thinking about a change, the changing world that we're in and, and, and climate change and where are there currently climate refugia, where should there be in the future to allow species to move and people to move in response to climate change, and that can also be an added like perspective to think about where what do we need now and what will we need in the future and you might find that the communities that have not been engaged and the places that have not been engaged in conservation are are very important places. So Deja, thank you so much for, for highlighting that. Um, Lydia, we're going to uh, go over to you now. So your, your work to advocate for um, Indigenous leadership in conservation and to engage Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, in hunting has provided some really important models for connecting uh, with communities, connecting communities to opportunities. Um, again, your, your focus being on, on hunting and, and fishing is, is incredible. And the work, the way that you do it is something that every is a model that people should really follow. So given your experience with national level work, um, which is important because a lot of times state agencies are dealing with large geographies where they do have to engage people across kind of a, a large uh, space. Um, what have you found to be useful methods or principles that state agencies should adopt uh, to engage diverse communities across large geographic areas? So this is a really good question and an interesting one. Um, and you might not really like the answer. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is that nobody can reach a community like the community members. Nobody can do it. Um, I am not going to be the liaison to uh, Asian hunters in the Southwest. <laughs> I'm not gonna be the liaison, liaison for uh, black hunters in the South. Um, I, because I'm not from those communities, I'm not from that culture, which is why we intentionally created hunters of color to be very inclusive of all communities of color. Um, I always say, you know, BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, 
is an acronym and not a monolith. Um, we, even within indigenous communities, there are over 500 federally recognized tribes, even many more that are still working and fighting to be recognized. Um, and we all have such different cultures. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, oh, the Native American word for, <laughs> or a Native American culture, because, and the same thing goes for literally any culture. Uh, you can't, I mean, you lump Asian as, a, as one, but it's not. Um, I see things that say like culturally specific. And then even, you know, amongst black folks, it depends on where you live. It depends on your family. It depends on um, where you come from, your history. It's not the same. <laughs> and so culturally specific always makes me laugh a little bit. Um, but anyways, all of that to say, maybe state agencies with the current makeups of most of them aren't going to be able to successfully reach communities of color and diverse communities that you're not a part of. And maybe the secret sauce is funding and supporting community led organizations, partnering, creating cooperative agreements with community led organizations. Um, making that a priority for literally, like I said, the sake of con the future of conservation, make that a priority in your budgets, make it a priority um, in your outreach um, to bring in diverse audiences. You're gonna need diverse folks leading that charge. Um, and I think that one of the things, and I'm glad that this is happening. I'm so glad that um, Mark, as you mentioned earlier, that feels like you're coming a long ways, which is really good. Um, and I all, I mean, I see right now the, and it's kind of what Deja was talking about too. There are still major issues. I mean, um, AFWA has the multi-state grant every year, but we applied to it and we're told, why would we support this small group when we could support, um, International Hunters Education Association? Um, and then I asked to see the demographics of the funding board, AFWA's funding board, and I was told no. Um, because I assume there's not a lot of folks like me. <laughs> I assume there's not a lot of folks like Alex and Karina or Deja. Um, and it's really, really frustrating to exist in a space where less than 0.5% of uh, all foundation funding goes to uh, organizations led by indigenous people. Um, and it's even smaller in the conservation space. You can look at Green 2.0's website, diversegreen.org, to see some of the statistics on that. Um, but we are having to fight for funding to be able to reach our communities. And what we really wanna do is partner with y'all. What we really wanna do is work with y'all to help everyone for the sake of conservation, to help the planet, to help what you guys are doing. We're gonna to need to figure out how to have less, how, to, how we can um, be supported when the funding boards are primarily white. We're having to live up to white standards, kind of like Deja was talking about um, and definitions of conservation, like Alex was talking about. Um, when in reality, those are not the same definitions and the same standards uh, for our communities. So anyways, so a lot to think about. <laughs> um, and I, I would love to see that uh, funding and support of community organizations be um, the success for all of y'all. So let me know if you need help with that. <laughs> Lydia, thank you so much for highlighting that. And again, goosebumps. I uh, and it, 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 it seems in my experience that those of us who are kind of within, you know, a community that falls under the umbrella of, you know, Black, Indigenous, or communities of color kind of most acutely understand that we cannot go into other communities and expect, you know, to just be able to, to, to inject ourselves into the space, right? We understand that even within our own demographic category, so to speak, that there is such an incredible diversity, which necessitates that shifting of resources, just like you said, um, to ensure that communities are empowered to do the work. So thank you so much for making that incredibly important point and for being such an incredible model for conservation happening um, across the country. Um, so equitable community engagement and biodiversity conservation efforts do require multi-pronged approaches that are looking both outwardly and looking inwardly at our state agencies or our, our organizations, um, including looking at hiring practices, um, offices, agency culture, funding choices and the way that our funding structures are set up as Lydia was mentioning. So Alex, this is for you. Um, you have worked uh, across probably a larger diversity of taxa than anyone I know um, and have had a lot of different experiences in different geographies and public and, and have an extensive background in working with public agencies. Um, and so are very familiar with that kind of culture. Um, and so given your experience, where do you see opportunities um, 
in the in the systemic and kind of standard operating procedures of public agencies to cultivate and retain talent from diverse communities so that the leadership uh, in these agencies are actually reflecting the diversity of the communities that they serve. Yeah, so I'll start with this. We need to destroy the table that we're working at. The table that we currently have is built on um, decades of systematic oppression, amongst other things. The table that we have now, it's a table that, like I said, has been built on oppression. It's a table with a semi-clean tablecloth on it. No matter how much we try to clean the table, it's still a, a dirty table. It just has that tablecloth on it. So we need to destroy that table and build a new table that's meant for everyone, that all can come and give and take from the table, the table equally. Um, and it's not going to be like, oh, this is our table, but you have a seat, but this is our table all has input in it all can take away from it so that's the first step is to destroy the current table that we are working on through conservation we need to build a new table that everyone can come through next many of our agencies they're hurting for our workers um yet many of these positions are going unfilled due to a lot of the barriers we have in place like certifiable experiences or degree requirements when many individuals have the skills and knowledge um, but it's not documented, or we go and we're burning employees because there's seasonal and turn employees that have been working in these positions for years, um, but we go and hire someone that's three months out of college to be their supervisors because they qualify for the hiring authorities. We need to start looking uh, within our agents to see what talent that we already have available uh, before we start and go out and recruit um, new talent. Um, that's one way that we can retain um, individuals into our agencies by looking within first before going out um, and getting new talent. And next, um, we need to be honest about what positions are available and where they are. Um, be honest if you know this position is in a, a known area where someone is, who is not white um, is going to be in that can have a huge um like not only mental and physical um, acts upon them, but be honest about those. Like there's a chance that someone would not like you for your skin color. Someone would not like for your gender identity. Someone would not like you for your sexual orientation. Be honest about these when we're looking to hire and move people into these areas. And also be honest about work culture. Uh, if you know the culture is not welcoming, don't send uh, someone fresh out of college down there or someone who's not typically of that same um, office background into those offices because you're literally going to automatically destroy their morale one, once they go in. And that's, um, we need to understand that biases exist. We need to um, work through those biases. And we also need to be understanding situational awareness um, that one instance that what's well, okay for me uh, might not be okay for you or understanding that just because you um, just because you are okay with going to someone's property who we haven't talked to in three years, um, that me, I'm okay with doing that. I have my own set of rules in place that no, I need to have verbal or at least some type of acknowledgement that yes, yeah, it's okay for me to go to your property while you're not there. Um, and I'm not gonna just go show up and say, oh, I, I was uh, one of the biologists who worked on this property. So you shouldn't expect um, another biologist um, to have the same um, thoughts as you. You need to understand that situations are different for um, different individuals, the way that they um, carry themselves, but also the, the way that they look. Um, you may can go to, the property that you worked three years ago and not have anyone come up and, to, uh, come up and ask what you're doing, that someone who looks at, like me or another person of color don't have that, that same um, privilege. So we need to understand those situational awareness. Um, next, um, it's time that we understand what is working uh, when recruiting and returning individuals. 
Um, and sometimes it means like understanding that programs, um, for instance, like on the three R program, recruitment, retention, and reactivation, it's it's not really working. It's recruiting the same individuals over and over again, but it's not actually diversifying anything. So that program uh, is it's going to be a continued broken process where you're like, why aren't we recruiting individuals? Because we're using the same old, same old things. So we, we need to be innovative and we need to actually uh, look and brighten our horizon to see why uh, we're lacking the skills to actually recruit people and then why our retention sucks. Alex, thank you so much. And, and it, it, it really, he, he, Alex has repeatedly done a, such an incredible job of, of detailing because not a lot of, I can speak particularly for, for what I understand of the Black experience in public agencies, not a lot of, of Black folks have been able to kind of stay in some of the public agencies that they've been placed in or that they've, they've worked in because of either the, the, the office culture or the culture of the place where they are, are working. And I you know, from personal experience, know that when I, you know, was going into rural Georgia, had not been below the Mason-Dixon line in my life, one of the things I was so grateful for was when my advisor told me before I accepted a position um, as to, to be her student and to do research down there, exactly what she had seen and experienced that would um, be dangerous for me or make me feel unsafe. She was very explicit about that immediately, and that prepared me for, and it was a preparation that I very much needed, and there's so many pieces to that puzzle, and Alex has over and over again, provided ideas and resources and, and tips um, to public agencies, federal and state, around how they can address these issues. So Alex, thank you so much for offering your, your expertise here. Um, so we are now going to, oh, Deja, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, just before we move into the breakout sessions, I really just wanted to add on to um, Alex's points because they were phenomenal. And, I, and when we talk about um, relevancy to what's going on in society and looking at like internal culture, I just wanna bring up the fact that, you know, you might have people working in more rural areas, areas that do not have people of color in them. And when you sending people out to places where they have to go on other people's property or they have to go knock on doors or engage with people who might not want to engage with us, just thinking about the fact that a, a, a young black boy was recent, Ralph Yall was, Real, was recently shot in the head because he rang the wrong doorbell. He was on the, he, he rang the doorbell on the wrong street trying to go pick up his siblings, right? Right house number, just wrong street. And that's, that's a reality that we, that we face when you're just living in this country is the fact that you may encounter individuals who don't want you near them, who don't, Think you belong in the area who won't even give you the grace of making a mistake and that is something that is that we really need to talk about um, when we talk about bringing in more diverse voices into the into our agencies um, I think about when I was um, I, I, I've never worked in any official capacity with U.S. Fish and Wildlife or um, other agencies but I have had internships um, working with the CDIP program. I was placed in Minnesota. The only Black person, the only Black intern there, and this was my first internship ever. I remember us having an, um, an, a land ethic workshop and some of the volunteers, the like official volunteers for that agency were making, well, for that visitor center were, were making like racist comments and just like historically, historically, inaccurate comments for my culture, you know, saying things like, oh, well, we, we came over to this country, we came over here for freedom and for this and for that. And I was like, that's not the case for everybody. So everybody wasn't, didn't come here for that. By the roots of my history, I was forced over here. And then those are, and there was this, there, it broke out into this huge argument where I, a person who wasn't even old enough to drink, had to have the capacity to have a debate it wasn't even a, a, a community conversation at that point. It was a, a debate um, on the history. And I, ha I had no support from anybody that I was placed there with. And it, it was a very tense interaction. And the fact that I still the entire summer had to frequently work with this individual um, and just being in a, a place far from home, never been there before, didn't have any family connections, no anything. So th those are experiences that... Um, 
those are experiences that make people of color not want to to stay in agencies. Um, it's a lot of, we we talk we're talking a lot about the external work and like how do we engage better like how do we you know how do we collaborate how do we do this and that but it's, it starts with the internal work and and not even just the internal work with the agency but the internal work within the people who already work there the internal work with yourself and examining your own positionality and your own experiences that have created your world views and then think about how that might be different than the people you are trying to engage and how that might be and how your lived experiences and your your the intersections of your identity and your positions and your ideologies, how that might differ from the people you're even trying to bring in to work with you. Inclusion does not mean assimilation. And I think that is what a lot of people have wrong about inclusion is that you cannot be like, oh, you know, like we hired all these diverse individuals, we're inclusive. Not, not if you're forcing them to assimilate into the culture that you already have in your workplace. Is your workplace safe for BIPOC individuals? So a lot of the work before we even start to look externally and about programs and engaging and what, where are we not doing the work, you need to be doing the internal work to make sure that you all are all on the same page and uh, making sure that you you have some um, competency in order to work with these individuals that you're trying to work with. Wow, Deja, I cannot thank you enough for bringing that to bear. Thank you for, for bringing up um, your stories and even the recent stories of young Black children in this country. Um, uh, Ralph Yar, for example, and uh, this is you know, we talk about it so much that maybe it kind of feels like wallpaper almost in our conversations, like when we're talking about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, but these are in many cases um, matters of, of safety, of life and death in some instances, and longevity in our ability to apply our passions and our knowledge to the outcomes we want to see in the world. And to do that, we have to be able to be able to work in environments that are, are healthy for us. So Deja, Alex, Lydia, thank you so much. Um, and, and we're going to provide an opportunity now to, to get into some breakout groups. And, and Jason has put the uh, questions in the chat. And so he's gonna, um, if all goes well with the tech, he's going to divide us out into breakout groups. Um, Alex, Lydia, myself, Deja, we will be kind of dispersed through the groups. We are not facilitating these groups. These are, um, we encourage you to select a, a person to kind of be the, the, the note taker in your group and to answer the following questions, which Jason mentioned at the beginning. Number one, what are the challenges that you and your agency face in engaging the full diversity of residents in your states and tribal nations in the swap revision process? So right now states are in the revision process. Where do you see challenges um, in engaging the full diversity of, of residents in your state and engaging tribal nations in the revision process, where and where are there opportunities? Okay, second question is similar, but focusing on the implementation of that conservation work. So where are there, where are there challenges that you face in engaging the full diversity of residents in your state and tribal nations in conservation implementation? And where do you see opportunities? And I, I really want, we want to challenge you to think about where geographically you are prioritizing conservation actions in your state. Um, so with that, Jason, I'll pass it over to you to kind of uh, disperse folks into the breakout rooms. Okay, thanks, Karina. So just bear with me for one second um, for the speakers. So Karina, Lydia, uh, Alex, Deja, um, just bear with me for a second. I'm going to try to reassign you so that you're in each one room. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and let's do this for about 15 minutes. So I'll call everyone back at about 310, um, and then we'll have some time for some report outs and hopefully be able to take some questions from our speakers. Hang on. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move Karina to room one. And Mark, I think you and I can go wherever. I'm gonna go ahead and join room four because it only has four people. Perfect. Um, and I got Lily, she's gonna work in room two. So I think we're in good shape. All right, I'm gonna go over and I'll break back at uh, 310.
we're all just early birds. Everyone else will be showing up in uh, about half a minute. And all these new people, it's amazing. You Jason, must just be oh, a sorry. Zoom whiz. You must just be a Zoom whiz. <laughs> no, I use MS Teams all the time. Uh, Zoom is like, no, I don't even know what it is. So, sir, you were asking, Chelsea? Where are you based out of, Jason? So I, so I work for a service headquarters, so I'm out in Virginia, but I've been teleworking okay. out of uh, Maryland. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, yeah. And especially on a day like today when it's going to be in the 70s. I'm All right. I think everyone is back. All I can say is I hope you all had as good a discussion as ours. Um, what did we like to do with if with the time we have, we have about 20 minutes here, is just with the four groups, just do a quick report out of some of the main highlights that you all heard. Uh, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. And I think, Karina, I may turn that back over to you, if you would, um, to help answer the questions. So I'll go ahead and I'll take the first breakout uh, that I was in. It was, it was pretty eye-opening. When it came to opportunities and challenges for the swap revision process, we heard different things about the fact that sometimes, you know, the city, the, the quote that stuck with me is that the city bus doesn't go to the state park. So, you know, making sure that people have this place to go to uh, be able to enjoy these areas is important. Uh, we also talked about the fact that you know, you may look around the office, you know, you refer back to what we just heard about doing the internal review. Well, if you look around the office, you may just see a lot of the same kind of faces and skin colors and tones and views as your own and other similar backgrounds. So, you know, how do you make sure that you're working to improve diversity within your own agency? One other thing that did come up, and I flagged it as an action, I'm not sure if this was similar to other groups, is there was a lot of interest in knowing how do you work with tribes. And for those of you who are new to this group, We've got you covered. We did a learning series a couple of months ago on that issue, and we're hoping to finalize the recommendations and a case study from that uh, shortly. In fact, where is she? Lily is here, um, who's been a Ray fellow with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and she's been working on that. So that'll be exciting. And then when it comes to the challenges you face when it comes to swap conservation, what we heard was were there were there two things that were really eye-opening. One was that a lot of the swaps, swaps are identified looking at rare species. And so when you're in an area where green space is more of a priority, what's that link? And how do you show how swaps can fit into that kind of conservation effort? And then the other one that really caught me was someone said, we're not allowed to use the words diversity, equity, and inclusion in our agency. So how do we, we have to be very careful how we couch those conversations because that's how it affects how we work with other communities. So like I said, it was pretty eye-opening for me. Someone else want to go from one of the other breakouts and talk about what you heard? I can go ahead um, from for breakout room too, since I was taking some notes. Um, so for the first question, some of the opportunities that were listed um, is that I know Montana said that they were doing a steering committee. So this is an opportunity to bring people outside the agency to give their voices and add to that. So that was one opportunity that was listed. Um, another thing is in South Dakota, we were hearing that the biggest opportunity is gonna be with funding. Um, and with these opportunities, we also listed a few challenges. So how to approach the tribes to start a conversation, um, specifically in Montana, how to get some people um, to represent the whole diversity of the state um, and starting that conversation with tribes is some of the challenges that were listed as things they had ahead. Um, I know that we also discussed another opportunity was um, to spend time within the community, engage with, engaging with people that you may not have in the past. So these were some of the opportunities. And then for the second question, um, I know one of the things that we had discussed also in our group that was pretty important part of discussion is that we talked about how there tends to be a little bit of like a bias against urban areas as the fact that people usually when they think of conservation, they think of these untouched habitats um, away from population centers. So important to think about those populated areas too, as we've discussed today and engaging people with these um, natural spaces. I will also really like to pass it on to Eileen because I know she had some really good points for um, the second question as well. She wants to add that. Uh-oh. <laughs> um. 
we talked a little bit about um, delivering conservation on the ground. And so in addition to involving people in the planning phase, there, there seemed to be more people interested in really getting involved in conservation. For instance, the kind of that millennial group, they seem to really care about things and they like to contribute and feel they're doing good things. So we thought uh, taking uh, advantage of community scientists, also the field of, of social science has continued to evolve and helps us learn from our experiences and be adaptive and do a, a better job in what would be this third time around. And I really like the idea of the urban spaces because I, I just found out today I'm gonna be on a just a short radio program in Sioux Falls, uh, for Sioux Falls audience, that's our biggest city in South Dakota. It's not very big compared to other places, but that that really clicked in my head. I need to think about, yeah, we're, we're not just talking about the wide open spaces. I need to think about how what we're doing in our plan is going to be relevant to somebody in a big city. So that was really personally very helpful to me that point. Thanks. Someone else want to go from one of the other breakout groups? Sure, this is Kristen. I'll take a shot at um, group three because I scrambled taking notes, but we had a good good group and didn't have time to even get to number two. So we just started with number one. But <clears throat> um, starting with the challenges, um, we had a couple swap coordinators on, on the part and said, you know, the, the depth and breadth of what we are trying to accomplish in the swap is so huge, um, is very overwhelming to figure out where you can apply your data-driven knowledge, what you need to know about species, the habitats, and where you're protecting them, and what you're doing, and as well as find out who those users are and where it makes the most sense to engage. Um, it's just a very big list, and um, I started off by saying it's wildly overwhelming, not that I'm not going to try, but um, it's just kind of figuring out where you can get that done. Um, a couple of folks mentioned um, being accessible and available in different languages and having focus groups where you kind of have sections of your swap that are targeted um, to areas or people that you might not necessarily work with and talk with on a regular basis and find out what they might need from that um, was a really great suggestion rather than using the whole state wildlife action plan and figuring out how to communicate that to everyone, just figuring out what pieces make the most sense to communicate where. Um, Another great point that was made was that these discussions are require a lot of relationship building. It can't be, hey, tell me what you know about diversity, equity, and inclusion so I can fulfill this piece of my chapter. Um, it can't be, and the term that was used is extractive. We can't just be taking for our needs and then off we go to the next um, task. And we all recognize that funding, time, and resources were really limited in getting this work done. and that constrains us on our availability to build these relationships. So that's one place that's a huge opportunity I think that we can all work on and look forward to. Um, and then similar to what Eileen was saying, not separating the people aspects and the biology conservation species aspects. Um, they are integrated, figure out what that geography is and where those integrations can happen. Um, I think that was kind of all we got to um, because <laughs> So we had we had great folks in our group that were really insightful and um, it was a good conversation. And anyone in group three, feel free to add. I can jump in for group number one. Um, I, you know, our conversation was was very similar to many of the other things that have been said in Mike Kristen's group. We did not uh, get to question number two either, which was unfortunate because it was it was a good conversation. But yeah, you know, there was a lot of the same themes coming up. Um, you know, just questions and um, concerns and, and uh, difficulties in interfacing with tribes, just not knowing how to do that, not getting responses from tribes with past efforts, and and uh, uh, you know, just trying to to build better relationships with tribes to to enhance those conversations in the future. Um, some of the same concerns about politics coming into play and, you know, many of us work for Parks and Wildlife Commissions and, and our hands may be tied in, in some situations and in some places not being able to have uh, some of these sensitive um, conversations. 
uh, a lot of the same themes about kind of ignorance and capacity and capacity not being sure how to interface with communities that our agencies are not accustomed to um, interfacing with and not having uh, the staff capacity. For example, Wisconsin has a tribal liaison, but it's you know one person for the whole of Wisconsin government. It sounds like, which is probably woefully inadequate. Um, so just you know lacking the human capacity to to create these new connections. Uh, but some you know good ideas about. Um, you know, you know, considering uh, cultural values when interfacing with tribes, showing up in places where these communities are, places like powwows, other community gatherings, things like that, and um, you know, finding people where they are and, and making sure that we're interfacing in their communities rather than uh, having an expectation that they're coming to us and want to be involved in our processes. So, um, a lot of the same conversation, but, but very good. And I wish we had gotten time to talk more about kind of the implementation side of things because. Some things I've been thinking about personally that I would have shared are, um, uh, you know, not just thinking about, so often we jump to who's going to be doing the work. Is it land trusts? Is it federal land management agencies? Is it private landowners? Things like that. But also just this idea that we need to be building coalitions of supporters and advocates. And that's an important part of implementation as well. So those are probably uh, communities and, and people and, and, you know, supporters we should be um, talking to as well. Great. Thank you. Well. We do have just a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions for any of our panelists? You can either raise your hand or go ahead and pop it in the chat. I would definitely uh, highly recommend not being shy in the, the seven minutes that we have left. Uh, um, Deja, Alex, and I believe, um, I believe our, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, I know Lydia had a, a meeting with a, a congressperson, so she may have, may have had to jump. But David, I see your, your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I would just ask the panelists for, you know, do you have recommendations for best practices or ideas? You know, I feel like I'm coming to this conversation, you know, flat-footed, and it's an area of growth for me. So I appreciated all the introductory comments, and that was a lot of good information and education. But as we're embarking on revising our swaps and moving towards implementation, do you have suggestions for best practices to how we can better engage the full diversity of uh, people in our states? Um, I mentioned with my group that it is an, it engagement can be really tough because it takes a long time to build the relate the proper relationships because they require trust and um if i don't know what the history of like the community you are hoping to engage has been with your agency but you know like maybe start there look at how at ways that you all have engaged prior um, look to see what's working, what's not working. Um, establishing trust takes so long. And I, I say this as a, as someone who has, as a, as a Black person who came to North Carolina and was running a, a participatory science project and thought that, oh, I'm going to engage the Black community here in North Carolina. No, I'm not from North Carolina. I am not a part of the Black community. Well, I was not a part of the Black community in North Carolina. I had no context. Just because I was Black does not mean that I am welcome into that space. It still takes time to meet the proper context, to be able to engage um, with who the who the leaders are um, and the proper, like who the proper people are. Um, and then I know uh, Kristen had mentioned it earlier, but we, a lot of times the work that we do is is very extractive and it's like oh can i pick your brain and that's no you cannot pick my brain that is painful and like just even the the imagery of that like the history of that that term can i pick your brain it is very extractive um and so think about how can you can provide for them because i know a lot of in, indigenous communities who are working within the conservation space like they have their own conservation officers and biologists and things like this and things like that, but they are also even more underfunded um, than, the, than our state and federal agencies are. Um, and so just kind of think of in terms of like collaboration and partnerships, like what can you potentially offer 
for them instead of first coming to the table like hey can you tell us about xyz or can you tell us this or that you know like you need to be able to provide something it can't always just you can't always come to a community with your hand out and expect them to just want to engage with you because why should they what what have you offered first you know like what what trust do they have like why should they continuously put out and they're not getting anything back and also add on top of that uh, a lot of times um, agencies uh, want to engage but they don't want to do any work it's more so like oh we're offering this we're offering this no one's coming to us well you know what sometimes you need to leave your table and go out into the field and go to them meet them where they are um so um just just be ready to act actively engage and not do the passive engagement where you're 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 fishing you're throwing out a lure and waiting for people to come come to you that you actually need to get up and, and, and go out great thank you okay so i think with that um I see one more hand john do you want to do you have a quick question so actually, if you do that, a... I'm going to have to leave in one minute. So Karina, I'll turn it over to you to close out. Thanks. Okay, sounds great. I, I just want to make a, a, a quick comment um, a, a, about, uh, it, you know, that was, it was, I think Lydia brought it up, but it's been brought up a couple other times, is that I know while well, like diversity programs at state agencies aren't uh, getting a bunch of funding or whatever, but I think it's really important um, that, you know, true engagement, we do need to share the funding. and. Um, you know, uh, like for today, uh, you, you know, providing, you know, we're providing a, a, an honorarium for our panelists for their time, for their expertise, and 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 also I, your courage. So thank you, thank you so much for for sharing that. But yeah, uh, we're not, you know, the state wildlife grants aren't bringing a lot of money or whatever. But uh, you know, I I think we need to think about the value of people's time. And engaging communities in 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 um, you know providing funding and other resources uh, that allow them to work independently to produce uh, you, you know their vision and share that with us. Great, thank you so much, John, for sharing. Um, and Jason, I can go ahead and close this out. I know you have to run, um, so I cannot thank enough our our panelists, Alex, Deja, and Lydia, who joined us today. And I want to reiterate that not only is it uh, uh, an incredible gift to learn from their expertise, but it is very brave of, of them to share because they are, and I can attest to this as well, repeatedly met with not just opposition, but but threats and and and, and threats to our our well being, our vocational uh, uh, trajectories, whatever it might be. So this is a, a heavy ask to ask people to come and speak on this topic, and they have been asked many times. And so I just want to thank them. Uh, sincerely for, for joining us today. Um, myself, and as John mentioned, are, are very excited to continue working with state agencies around um, integrating equity into state wildlife action plans and the process of, plan, uh, of doing those revisions. Um, and we are looking forward to opportunities to continue to apply what we learned from Alex, Deja, Lydia, and others we've heard from uh, recently and over the past several years when we've been thinking about relevancy. Um, so thank you so much to AFWA, Mark, um, and to, to Jason for inviting us to participate today. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, my inbox is open and I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you on future meetings for the Wildlife Diversity Program Managers. Um, and we hope you have an excellent rest of your day. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And this is 99% uh, Karina. So thank you for all you did, your vision and just excellent speakers, um, Alex and Deja. Um, just can't say enough, can't thank you enough for coming in and uh, helping us with this. And this is a, a long journey that uh, you're, you're helping us get started on. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.